Yeah, no. <laughs> well, that's unfortunately the issue with like technology and anything government regulated is it's always going to be behind industry and what's new. Uh, well, technology in particular. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I, I don't, this is, um, my personal opinion, but I don't particularly agree with the way our the American education system works. But I, I'm not going to get into that. <laughs> yeah, so um, I am recording now. So uh, this is the beginning of, I think we're in the fifth session right now. Um, so I, I think I'm just going to try sense of, I, I think you, you missed the day, right? So yeah. I'm going to Oh, okay. All right. So you're up to speed already. Cool. Okay. Okay. So um, I did resize things a little bit. You can make your badge a little bit bigger if you'd like or smaller, how, however you want it. Um, I'm pretty sure this will work properly. My only concern is that the diodes for blue... Um, require particularly a high voltage, a 3.3 volts, and the nickel battery is only 3 volts. So it might be a little dim, but um, I did this kind of like on my own. I, I use LT Spice to simulate uh, circuits because it's free, uh, but you could have used uh, P Spice or Multisim uh, just the same. But um, here's our schematic, and we have four LEDs. Um, and I, I made changes to the circuit. I'm not sure if you saw that too. I changed some of the components by the transistor here. Yeah, okay. So I had to lower that resistance at the base current and the transistor because I needed more current to be pulled through the LEDs because we are only getting about four milliamps and uh, they're rated for 15 milliamps. So, um, so now we have about 14 milliamps going through uh, each of these diodes. And then we have three volts from the battery. And so what we got here is as soon as you throw that nickel battery in, it should blink on really fast and then slowly gonna turn off for about three seconds and then turn back on and then turn off and turn back on. That's gonna give it its glowing effect, right? Um, so I, I'm pretty confident that this will work, <laughs> hopefully. Um, when I order these, I'm gonna order just five uh, and then I'll put together a circuit, make sure it works. And then if it does, then I'll print them in bulk and we can have other students uh, assemble them as well. Um, that's part of the reason I, I picked all um, through hole components. You could have uh, picked all surface mount and then have the manufacturer put the components on for you. Uh, but I wanted to do the through hole so I could help so I could have students learn how to solder as well, because uh, that's another useful skill to have. Um, so with the logos, it's actually super easy. Um, you don't even need like, well, the only reason you would need another imaging software is to reduce the size of the image. Um, but if you already have a logo in mind, KiCad has a built-in image converter. Um, oh, actually, I'm sorry, before I do that, uh, you're going to want to go to your folder, go to where you had your KiCad projects, and then go to imported libraries. Essentially, what we're doing is we're taking an image and we're saying, okay, this is a footprint, but this footprint doesn't consist of any copper traces. It's just silk screen. Um, in this case, it will be a logo. So I put it in the imported libraries and I made a logo section. And that's where I'm going to import all my uh, created logos. So the way you do that, after you've created that folder, um, you go to image converter. Um, all the files that you use for silkscreen have to be bitmaps, which are .bmp files, I believe. So you can't use .png or .peg. 
Um, so what this does for you is you can upload those .pngs and then it will create a bitmap out of that picture for you. So for example, when I click on load bitmap, it'll ask for an image. Um, I have this IEEE logo, so I'll go ahead and use that. Okay. And then um, it will give you a preview, kind of. Some Sometimes this is off, <laughs> but uh, you can see um, how it looks with the uh, different uh, black and white or grayscale. Um, but the main important thing is, uh, oh, it looks like you can even change the size here. So let's mess around with that. Uh, 130, let's do and this is in millimeters. So let's go ahead and export that. I triple E. I yeah, so I got it online. Uh, but you can go you can literally you can just Google logos right now. I triple E logo yeah. save an image yeah. if you if you'd like, yeah. So this one's gonna be 155. It's good to have multiple sizes of the same logo too, because um, if for whatever design you have, it might be bigger or smaller. So having the different size logos will allow you to just slap it on your board still. Um, now, I mentioned this before to you guys, but for you guys watching the recording, um, be careful when you have these little tight spaces here around, in this case, the IEEE logo, it's kind of small. So depending on the manufacturer and the size of your silk screen, um, this might kind of mesh or merge because they're so close to each other. Uh, like this, this thing's probably going to show up as just a dot on the board when we actually make it. Uh, but yeah, it, it does handle resizing. So that's actually nice. You don't even need the exterior software. Um, you're obviously, well, not so obviously, but you're going to make a footprint because like I said earlier, it's, it's a footprint, but with no copper traces, just silk screen. And depending on what uh, side, oh no, there's only the one. So you're going to want to select front silk screen here. It should be selected already, but I'm not, it might be different for you guys. So, okay. So then after you've loaded your image, so you selected that, um, and then you selected the image, you're going to click on export to file. And then it'll ask you where you want to save it. And I didn't do it to the first one, but I recommend adding the, the size of that uh, logo because it'll help you when you're in KeyCAD and picking out the logo. So in this case, I call it IEEE logo. It's 155 about by 60 millimeters. Maybe I should change it. To... Let me know when you've got a logo and you're ready to go. So we have about, we have three more sessions um, for this month. And then this workshop's going to be over because I didn't want to go too far deep into uh, people's time with finals and stuff and studying. Um, okay. So after you, you've got your photo and you've converted it to a bitmap, what you're going to do then is you're gonna go back to here. You're gonna to go to preferences, manage footprint libraries. And what you're gonna to have to do is you're gonna to have to import that folder I told you guys to create. You're gonna to have to import that. So to do that, uh, you can add, you can either click a folder or you can create like a custom one. So uh, IEEE logo tests, okay. And then I can 
click on the right box here and click the folder. And I'm going to go to here, logos. And remember, when we did the footprints, you just had to select the folder. You didn't have to select any files in it. So I'm selecting the logos folder, select folder, and then you're all set to go. Um, I already had uh, mine imported those, so I'm gonna delete this logo test. And then once you've created that, you can click okay. All good, all right. So then um, you can actually custom add components to your board. Uh, even though they're not associated with the schematic. So it's the same shortcut. If I click A, it'll open up all my footprints. And then I can go down to the IEEE logos is what I named mine. And you can see the two logos I have created here. So let's go ahead and pick this one. Hey, wow. So this is the 156 uh, by 60 millimeter, which is obviously way too big, right? Um, which I guess that's one thing that can be helpful knowing the dimensions of your board. So 86 by 51, I would have already known that the uh, size of that logo is too big. Um, so the original file uh, for the logo was actually a lot smaller. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, so go ahead and just go back to the bitmap, re-upload it, and then change the size. So something within the realm of 20 by... I don't know, 20 by 40 millimeter, something around that. And if it, if it is too big, we should be able to just throw this to the back, I think. Yeah. So I can put this on the back silk screen too if I wanted. And it even it even flips it for you so that when you flip the board, it will be the proper direction. So but yeah, that's how you, you can add any of these uh custom uh logos here. I can I can even put Put one here, and then I'm gonna select it. Yeah. <laughs> um. So after after you place the logo, um, you're gonna click it and then press E. And then here, uh, for position, there's a side drop down, and you can select front or back. So now I have uh, one IEEE logo on the front, th which is this one in yellow. And then I have one IEEE logo in the back, which is this one. And if that's kind of hard to see, what you can do is you can go to layers and you can actually, you can change what layers you see. So I can turn off front silk screen and now I can just see the back silk screen. Um, one other thing I decided to change too is there's this G designator with the logos. Um, they are also on the silk screen layer, and I don't want that to show up on our board. So currently, if I go to view and I look on the back of my board, there's the G star star star. I don't want that. So the way you fix that is you can select just the G star star star, and you can't delete it because it's the designator for the footprint. Um, but I can go to edit and I can change what layer it's on. And so basically I'm gonna change it into a user comment. And now it's blue. And now if I go to 3D viewer again, you'll see that the G star 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 is gone. That way I just have my logo. Um, go ahead and turn the front silk screen back on. And that should be it. That's just about everything for this design. Um, so what I'm gonna do is I'm going to print out about five of these boards and just 
uh, solder everything in and make sure it works properly. And then I'm going to order them in bulk. And if uh, students want to uh, come to the design studio and learn a little bit about soldering, we can do that. Um, we might even make use of it uh, next semester because now we have boards to practice soldering with. Um, um, I, I think at this point, so we're, we're completely done with this design. We have all the measurements. Um, for those of you, I, I don't think I went into detail about all these measurements, but um, this measurement is just from the board to the side of uh, the whole area for the lanyard. And so I, I tried to get it about as um, equal as possible so that it's centered. And then here I've got, um, that's the distance for the circle part from the center to the outer end, so the radius of the semicircle. Um, so those should be the same. And then here's the length uh, of the lines here. So just to give me an idea about the dimensions, um, the width I got here, which I still think might be too small, but hopefully <laughs> hopefully you'll be able to fit a capo, not a capo, I don't know why I keep saying that. Um, what's it called? Not a lanyard, but yeah, carabiners, yeah. Uh, yeah, because uh, not everybody has a lanyard, but carabiners are a lot more common. So I was hoping this would be good enough too. Uh, one more important thing is I, I used to have this really close to the edge here. Um, keep in mind that that distance is about not like a maybe about half a millimeter, depending where you have it placed. So that might be really fragile. So I really recommend lowering it, lowering it, putting putting it further down. So mine's about five and a half millimeters down. So hopefully that's good enough. But besides that, this um, this design is finished. So what we would do now is um, you would need to create your Gerber files. So the way you can do that is save and then I guess I'll show both ways. Um, I'll show the default way first, and then I'll talk about JLC PCB because you you need a external plugin for that, and we will we can go over that in the future. But you're gonna go back to the main library page here, and Gerber viewer. I'm sorry, I'm just, I think it's here. Yeah, okay. All right, my bad. Um, go back to the um, file with our design. You're going to click on file and you're going to click on fabrication outputs. Most manufacturers, what they require is they require a Gerber file. That's a pretty standard file format for PCB uh, fabrication. And then they're going to need drill files. So that tells them what location each hole that they have to make in the board is. Um, there, if you're going to have your board, um, have all the components placed in at the manufacturer, they're also gonna require a bill of materials. And KiCad will do some of that for you, but you need to select the real life components for each uh, component in your schematic. And you have to verify that they're the correct components and that they're gonna work. Um, that's completely up to you to figure out, unfortunately. But so we're going to generate Gerber files. Um, we're going to select where we want that. So we can just save it here, I guess. So I triple E badge. All right, you know what? I'll just create a new folder. So I triple E badge. 
fabrication files. And I'll just use this folder. Okay. And then some some companies I, I believe KiCad automatically selects all the layers that you actually have on your board, but some companies may require extra information. So like if any of your components have any adhesives on it. Um, I think I think the rest of these don't really matter. So like courtyard is like outlines of components. Uh, user drawings are kind of like to give a better idea of what the PCB is going to look like. So if, if you had like a certain section on your board that like it could only have a certain height, then I might make a user drawing uh, for that section of the board to remind me, oh, I need to place my components on this side of the board because they're too tall, right? Um, so those are just helpful tools for the user who's designing the board, but the manufacturer doesn't really need that. So. In general, they need the copper layers, they need the paste layers, they need the silk screen, they need the mask and the edge cut, of course, so they know the cutout of your board. Um, once you've got all that, plot. So once you click plot, it'll say create a Gerber job file and it put it in, should put it in the folder I designated to. And then it said done. And then you can also, from this same view, you can generate the drill files while you're here too. Um, and there's a bunch of options depending on what file format they prefer and whatnot. So I'm gonna go with the defaults, generate drill file, and done. And those will all be in the same folder. So if I go here, or you know what, let's, let's open it up in the Gerber view so you guys can see what that looks like. So here in the Gerber view, we can see um, what our Gerber files look like. So this can help verify like, okay, um, I've made my board design, I made my Gerber files. Now I wanna make sure that the manufacturer sees what I see that, and to see if the Gerber files were made pro properly. Um, so I can click on file here. I can click on open Gerber plot files. And I'm going to go to the IEEE badge fabrication files I made. And I'm going to select only the Gerber files. I, I don't think it needs this Gerber job. I think it just needs all the layers. Let's see if that works. So, yeah, as you guys can see, the format's a little bit nastier in the Gerber view. But I'm just going to, there we go. Okay. So I'm going to, you can take off some of the layers here. So this green is all copper. Um, this dark blue color is solder mask. And dark gray is also this paste silk screen so you can see all the layers here on the right um and for the most part i think this is all correct that's right so i believe all the green is the back Red is the edge cut. Oh, okay. So another tip is uh, these little diamonds here. And you can do this in the other KiCad file area. You can click on the, on the left of any of these layers and it'll bring it up to the top so you can see it. So um, right here, this green is the back copper and this is all green because I made that ground plane on the back of the board, so that is correct. And then there should be front copper right here. So that's 
unfortunately also green. <laughs> so the front copper is a darker green and this back copper is like a lighter green. You can kind of see the colors, but I can't really tell. You can change all these colors too if you want. Does it look the same way for you guys? Okay. All right, then it's possible I have different settings set up because I, I was on version five and then I updated the version six. So um, let's go ahead and let's also open up the drill file. Okay. So those should line up over all the holes. Let me try and get that. There we go. So right here, these blue areas. So you can see IEEE badge uh, P padded through hole dot drill. So DRL are your drill files. So we got this one and this one. Okay. So you can see that they're gonna drill holes for all the components here. And for the vias too, because they have to drill the holes for that too. And you can see all the components and all the holes line up properly. Sometimes uh, it may turn out that the drill holes are like somewhere else, like out in the abyss of the file. So um, keep an eye out for that. Uh, sometimes that happens. Uh, just to verify, did are you guys as drill holes also lining? Actually had it just the same as we were working with just now because that would make your life a lot easier. Um, but these are the once you've done this though, and everything appears to look proper, um, these are the files that you would submit to uh, the producer. Now uh, we have eight more minutes. Really quick, I'm just gonna give a quick rundown. Um, so that, that was just to verify that your Gerber files are proper. And now you would submit that to the manufacturer. Um, one more thing that KiCad has is uh, if you click on plugin and content manager, there's, uh, there's different plugins you can mess around with. Uh, some of them work, some of them don't. So you kind of just have to mess around with that. So if I go to here, KiCad official repository, these are all the plugins you guys can take a look at. You don't have to use them, but some of them might be convenient or helpful to you. Uh, but I went through a company called JLC PCB to manufacture my board, and I had to get a specific plugin and everything just for that. And that's because the bill of material files that KiCad generates are not the proper file format that PL JLC PCB uses for their designs. So um, it's a it's a CSV file format that they generate. And I guess there's different standards to what the CSV file, file format is. And JLC PCB uses a different one than KiCad. So unfortunately, I had to go and find this plugin and I had to set it up. You can find uh, this uh, Bounties, bon I don't know how to pronounce that, Bounties KiCad repository, but you can go online, you can download the plugin, it's completely free, and then you um, 
you would manage it and then it pulls it from this URL. So he'll give you the URL in his uh, GitHub and you can just paste the URL here and then you save it and then it'll pop up here, it'll populate. Make sure you click on the drop down and you're not in KiCad official repository. You have to go to his repository and then you should see KiCad JLC PCB tools and then you'll click install. Once you've installed that, if it's working properly, when you open up your uh, PCB schematic, you'll see a JLC PCB tools button. And this does basically everything that we just did right now, um, but it generates all the Gerber and drill hole files in a proper format for JLC PCB specifically. So make sure to keep that in mind. Sometimes you might run into errors and you have to find other ways to fix that. Um, for, for you, I was talking earlier about the naming scheme. This is what I was talking about. So this is basically the bill materials, right? Here's all the reference designators. Here's the values I gave the names for these components. And so it can be useful to not just include the value, but also like voltage ratings. I wasn't worried about this one because everything's three volts. So like, there's nothing that's going to damage anything because they're all running at the same voltage, but. And it, it was just a really simple design for uh, everyone <laughs> to just to start out with. Um, so one last thing before I end this se session, I'm going to save this and I'm going to save uh, the schematic. I want to show you guys what we're going to be working on next. Um, so this is going to be a new project. And you guys don't have to do this now. I'll walk you guys through the whole thing uh next week um but next week we're going to take a look at the developer kit um so this developer kit is based on the esp32 um it's a it's a bit more of a complex design so we're going to be working with a couple more components but it's not as bad as you think it is i'll walk you guys through all of it because i use the same thing for my senior design and then um as far as routing goes, it'll go a lot quicker because I'm going to introduce you guys to what something called an auto router. And so you can use this as a tool to automatically make all the connections that have to be made for you. And then all you have to do is you have to verify, okay, this signal is not going to have too much noise with where it's placed. Uh, so this is okay. Um, Oh, no, one thing to note about this board is uh, this one's a multi-layer board. So we have a front copper layer, we have a back copper layer, and then we also have two inner copper layers. So there's inner one copper and inner two copper. If we look at the color scheme here, we have red for the front, we have blue for the back, orange for the, fir for the second inner layer, and green for the first inner layer. Um, so this board will have to be manufactured through, uh, well, some manufacturer, uh, it won't be able to be made here. Um, but this is, this is what we have to expect next. This is what we're going to make. And then I'm going to print out about 10 of these with the components on already. Uh, this one's going to be working with surface mount components. And then these are through hole pins on the side so that you can plug this into a breadboard and you can use it for whatever you choose to use it for. It's a lot like an Arduino. Uh, you program it using uh, C++, I believe. So um, the only extra things is uh, the ESP32 is capable, capable of Bluetooth communication and also Wi-Fi communication. Um, but if that's not, if that's not what you guys want, um, if you're not gonna use Bluetooth, you're not gonna use Wi-Fi, then I highly recommend uh, creating the STM32 developer kit. If you're interested in that, then just let me know and I'll throw up a design because um, th these, these are pretty easy. I'm used to the habit of creating these so I, I can go through them really quickly. Um, so the STM32 can't do Wi-Fi or Bluetooth, but it has a lot more processing power because it has more room in the chip to allow for that. So. But that, that's basically all for this session. Uh, this is what you guys have to look forward to. Um, 
in the following uh, three sessions. And then I'm going to go over that auto routing tool, um, which can save you a lot of time. Okay. I wanted you guys to make the traces yourself, though, just to get used to how to make the connections manually, because yeah. you'll have to do that pretty often. Um, and the auto router is not reliable at all. I'm going to be blunt. Um, the auto router doesn't know what signals are important. That's up to you as the designer to keep that in mind. Uh, any high voltage lines, you don't want them knocked up really close to each other, or you don't want this uh, 24 volt line like right next to the ground, <laughs> right? So those are things you need to look out for in your designs. The auto router can't do that for you. But it can make sure that it's actually possible to make all the connections in the first place. Mm -hmm. And it can give you an idea like, okay, this layout seems good or, oh, this layout's bad because all these connections at this one chip are really hard. So maybe I can put this chip here on the board and maybe the connections will be easier. Um, and I, I actually did that recently in my senior design. Uh, my project had 140 vias because this one chip on the bottom left corner had four traces that had to go all the way across to a connector on the other side of the board. Um, you can actually see that in my old design. I'll, I'll show you guys later. Um, so I took that chip and I moved it next to the connector. I took the components there and moved it back to the bottom left. And it literally cut the amount of vias on my board in half. And what that means is I have to go from the front to the back layer less often. And generally that's a good indicator of a better layout, okay? Mm -hmm. You want the least amount of vias. Ideally, you wanna just stay front and then have ground on the back. Or if you're gonna have multiple layers, uh, you have to plan your layers out, but that, we're not gonna get into any of that, but um, it is something to consider if you work for a company and work with high frequency communications and stuff. So, all right, I'll, I'll let you guys go. Thank you for attending the first uh, uh, PCB session. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It'll be cool to actually see it in person too, so. Yeah. <laughs> so, all right. See you. No worries. <laughs> Have a great day. Thank you for coming. I'm going to make like. Five or ten. If you want to buy one yourself, you can, but you have. To... Okay, so you have to order at least five boards, but not all of them have to have components. Uh, each one with components is about forty bucks. So for five, it was about one hundred thirty, one hundred fifty dollars. Uh, these are more expensive because they're four layer boards. So that's how I reduce the size of this board so much. <laughs> no no i don't need your money um i'm going to uh i have a budget already set out for all the boards so i'm going to order about 10 um as long as the nuclear power plant visit doesn't dig too much into our funds if that happens but if everything goes as planned that shouldn't happen <laughs> so i'll be able to order maybe like 20 boards even excuse me let me give them up uh we have about 15 to 20 people right now so yeah and I, I was hoping that more but with the problems we're having with transportation uh, we had about 30 last semester so we almost filled up a whole party bus i don't know if it was like a party bus or what but it was like this slim black bus and it was really nice <laughs> Consolation? So we're, we're having students send it directly to Consolation now because of, you know, obviously for security reasons. Um, so that that's up to you to decide if you want to send that to her or not. Um, she works at the company as a CEO, so everything is uh, handled in a confidential manner. Right, so your your information is protected. Um, 
but yeah, that's up to you. So we we ditched the whole file, Dropbox, all that because of security issues. So I have her email and number listed in the instructions. If you go to my PMW Life, it tells you where to go. Just let me know once you've sent it to her so I have a better idea of the headcount. Or instead of sending me an email, you can register for the IEEE PMW event. It should be on there now. Um, that will also help me give an idea of who's going. So. Right, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I understand. Um, I didn't know that. Okay. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it ideally it depends how long we get the bus, but we'll be starting at eight a.m. So we'll be meeting on campus at eight a.m. Yeah. Yep. Uh, probably in front of the uh, Lashi, the Lash building. Um, and then we're gonna drive all the way out to Dresden, and then. Um, we're going to get a tour of the whole plant. It's a really big plant, um, but with a bigger nuclear power plant comes with more security stuff. So like, even if we wanted the carpool, we can't. So we have to find a bus or else we can't go. Um, the reason we need a single vehicle is because uh, they bomb sniff the vehicle when you get to the plant. So they make sure there's no bombs in the vehicle and they don't want multiple vehicles coming into the same plant. Um, and then there's other security measures, just like uh, Braidwood. But Braidwood was a smaller uh, plant. They only had two reactors, and I believe one of them was not in use. Uh, Dresden has eight, and one of them aren't in use. So that's seven reactors total. So that's a lot more secure. So, yeah. That's crazy. yeah. Yeah, but it's it's really cool, and if we do get the amount of time we want, which is probably around like uh, 4 to 6 p.m., um, we'll have time for mock interviews as well, and food will be what provided to us. Yeah. So you get a whole tour, you get food around lunch, and then you have interviews to work at the power plant. What? Uh, you're, you're, yeah, you're stuck you're stuck with us then. Okay. <laughs> so but you can at least get your name out there if you happen to reconsider or they uh maybe offer you a considerable salary that may be of interest to you then uh you can reconsider yeah. maybe so oh, they, i'm sorry they yes yeah because uh Although it's a nuclear power plant, the whole purpose of the plant is to generate power. So they need power engineers that know how to work with the grid. So there, there's a whole switch yard, there's uh, the, the steam generators, um, transformers. Yeah. What does it do? I'm sorry? What was the question? So, um, I'm not sure. Braidwood did about like two megawatts, I think. Uh, but I'm not. I'm not entirely sure off the top of my head. I I'd guess that Dresden would have to be more because they have more reactors, so they're generating almost double as much as power. So probably closer to like four megawatts. It's next Friday. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's it's definitely really cool. Not everybody gets to say they've been in a nuclear power plant. And it, it is very a very secure <laughs> like area like it's it's crazy how secure these power plants are at least in america <laughs> well well yeah and we've learned from a lot of those other um meltdowns yeah. 
Like, uh, I believe there was one in Japan um, where they got flooded. I, I, th I think Japan's the right place. I'm not entirely sure. But there was a power plant that got flooded. And the reason that reactor ended up having a meltdown is the backup diesel generators that they had were in the basement of the plant. So when the flood came, it flooded the generators too. So they couldn't shut down the plant because all the generators were flooded. So... Uh, not sure. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah, right. Because <laughs> that's the main thing. You have to maintain that temperature or else. Uh... Right. Yep. And I learned a little bit more about like the nuclear process. So when when the two atoms collide, they release a neutron from the collision. And then that neutron will cause another uh, right. chain reaction. Yeah, and so multiple neutrons will come firing out. And if it's too hot and there's not enough, um, do they use lead? There's, there's a type of, uh, I don't know. Yeah, they, they use a, like a type of lead or some type of material to control the amount of neutrons that are uh, causing the collisions. That's how they control the reactions. And then they have to keep the temperature at a low level as well. So there is coolant, which is the light. Yeah, it's in a bath of water, but they, they also control the amount of reactions that are occurring, nuclear reactions. Yeah. Well, you might be burnt, but I mean, some of that water is really hot. Uh, that's one of the things they talked about is even though even though the bath of water wasn't steaming, it was actually really hot. But the reason it wasn't steaming is because they're not just letting that water sit and heat up. They have a flow of cooler water going through the system. So the, you're never going to see the water actually steam up unless there's a problem. So that water is actually like 400, 500 degrees Fahrenheit and you're, you're going to get burnt. Uh, but uh, yeah, that was something I thought was really cool. And the radiation actually isn't green either, it's blue. So you'll glow blue, not green, so. There actually are companies working on mini nuclear reactors right now. And I found out recently that we actually do have fusion reactors, but they're not built at an industrial level or well enough to generate. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, some of these people don't even know what they're talking about, how the power grid works. Uh, I've heard a lot of people say like, like battery electric vehicles are the solution to uh, climate change, but battery electric vehicles cause even more pollution through the manufacturing of a vehicle. It's it's pretty old, yeah. Yeah. But I mean but but the what what is required to generate the extra power that's needed for all those battery electric vehicles, it's doable. We've we've increased We've increased the grid by like two to four megawatts in the past, or even more power than that. But um, it's not going to solve the issue because the manufacturing process of those Tesla vehicles or high, or fully battery electric vehicles is not. It's going to cause even more pollution in some cases than rather regular gas vehicles. Um, Mm -hmm. Yeah. If, if you are actually concerned about climate change, then hybrid electric vehicles are probably a better option for you because the the main operation of those vehicles is to shut off the vehicle. Um, so then you're causing no pollutants. You're not burning any gas, and you're saving gas. But you're probably gonna have to pay for a starter every two years or so. So. Oh, yeah, you can turn it off, but then that defeats the purpose of, you know, decreasing the pollutants. <laughs> but... mm -hmm.
Well, he didn't want to die. Uh, that that's not the point of this. <laughs> no, so yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's fine. Yeah. I didn't want to upload two different videos. Uh, a lot of people wanted one whole big session, so I just kept it as one recording. Does it have sessions? Yeah, yes, yeah, so I do from one to two and two to three. Yeah. That way, that kind of protects me too. If I go through any different material, they can refer to the video and they can see it. So. All right, uh, can all you guys open up your uh, IEEE badge files? Sure, no worries. Um, we're not going to do a whole lot. Uh, basically, I'm going over finishing touches with you guys. So I believe last time, uh, last week, we went through all the connection for all the, uh, each trace. Is that right? So, and you guys don't have to connect it exactly like how I did. I just, um, yeah, exactly. Uh, right angles are okay. It's kind of unavoidable sometimes, but uh, no acute angles. That's a more stringent rule. 90 degree angles are okay, but you're kind of pushing it. But I, ideally, you want all obtuse angles. Um, another thing to keep an eye out that I more recently started paying attention to is how you're connecting to the pad too. Because uh, this trace here, connecting to the pad, this is an acute angle right here. And so that's gonna eat away at the pad and the trace. If you click it and then click again and drag, you, you can get a straight 90 degree connection with the pad. And that's kind of why I say 90 degrees okay. With the circular ones, uh, I don't think you really have to worry about it as much. I mean, maybe you can change it, um, but it's not as much of a worry for these ones. But it, with the square pads, you can you can get some really nasty small angles depending on how you connected the trace, like that oh. one. So just keep an eye out on that. Um, let me know when you guys are ready. Uh, I'll show you guys how to make custom silk screens. So you can put any logo on your board that you guys want. Ones I'm going to make are, are going to say I triple E, but you can use any logo you want in your design. Um, I actually just found out recently, um, some really nice features, uh, more features that KeyCAD provides to you for, uh, resizing images and stuff. So. Uh, let me know when you guys are ready, okay? Uh, yeah. You guys need help or is everything all right? Oh, uh, okay. Mm -hmm. oh, no. <laughs> it's going all right. Uh, not good. <laughs> I got my I got my data structures exam back, and I failed the exams.
What is that? Um, it's not hard concepts. I, I'm having a hard time with the professor. I forget her name. It's like Roy something. Something oh, Roy. <laughs> it, 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 used, it used to be craft, uh, but it's not anymore. Lucy's really awesome. I loved her as a professor. Yep. She's gone. She left. <laughs> I've never been there. I'll have to check it out. <laughs> yeah, I've heard of a lot of funky stuff happening in particle accelerators, like uh, getting certain particles to go faster than the speed of light. Yeah, quantum particles. Mm -hmm. Um, in the meantime, for you guys that are ready, go ahead and open up Google and just look up a, an image. You, logo. Yeah, yeah, you can look up any image. Uh, so I'm just going to look up logo. Um, no, PCAD will do the resizing for you. So I will show you guys how to do that. <laughs> right. PlayStation logo, maybe? Some kind of looks cool. <laughs> yeah, um, I guess we'll find out. <laughs> Yeah, it looks like WebP is not an option. I'm not worried. All right, yeah, I guess I'll just search I triple. <laughs> oh, man. No, can't win. No, I don't think so. I think it has to be a dot. Yeah, man. Um, if you can find dot SVG files, yeah, those should be okay. Um, ideally. Oh, and if you have it in bitmap format already, that's perfect, too. Uh, 
because the point of this converter, the converter KiCad has uh, takes whatever file format you put in and turns it into a bitmap, which is basically a SVG, which is, I think, space vector graphics. Yeah. <laughs> Here we go. I triple E student branch. <laughs> so yeah it does look like you can use bitmap png jpeg uh, JP, TIF, GIF, PNM, PPM, PGM, all these file formats here. So you, if you have any of these file formats, those should be okay. So here's the one I just got. And I know the view looks a little weird. There's the figure. And then um, pay attention to this size here. So you can change the size of your logo here. Yep. So you, yeah, so you should know the size of your board roughly, and um, you'll be able to pick a size that will fit onto your circuit board. Every time you export these files, I recommend putting the dimensions of the logo on there. So I'm going to name this IEEE Correct. So you will have to you, you would have to do that every single time. So that's why I recommend putting the dimensions. So if you have one already, you don't have to redo it. So once you've once you've picked up a, a figure um, you can select it and then you can, so you'd click load bitmap, you would select the file, it'll convert it into a bitmap and then you can export it to a file. Um, oh, you know what, before you do any of that. Yeah, so really quickly, I recommend, so essentially what we're doing here is we are creating a, we're importing a footprint uh, but the footprint has no copper traces or tracks or pads or anything. It's just silk screen. Okay. So I went to imported libraries and I made a footprint folder called logos. And that's where I'm going to put all the logo footprints. So when you go to export your file, I'm exporting it to this logos file here. All right. So once you've done, let me know once you guys have done that. If you have any problems, just let me know. What was it? Um, 
Oh, okay. So, That's weird. Uh, mine was like 70 by 40 millimeter, I think. Uh, let me plug in my last one. Okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Definitely. <laughs> okay. Well, buddy. All right. So the first thing you're gonna have to do. Um, if you guys remember Reminisce way back when we imported those libraries, we now have to import that logos folder we just made. So you're going to have to go to Preferences and Manage Footprint Libraries. And then I put it in Global Libraries so I can see it across all my files. And you're going to, you can either click on the folder button or you can click the plus. You can give it a, a custom name. So IEEE test logos example whatever and then you would click on the right here and you're going to select the file or if you click the folder then this should pop up already and i'm just going to go to that logos folder now you don't have to select anything in the folder you just need to select the folder itself so logos select folder and there we go all set to go um of course i already did this i have ieee logo so i'm gonna go ahead and delete that okay now you can cuss you can custom add components and holes and everything to your board from here, even though it's not on your schematic. I just haven't shown you guys that. It's the same shortcut key. You can click A. And then if you go down to whatever you named it, it's in alphabetical order. I can go down to IEEE logo and here's all the logos I made. So here's the new one I picked out. So that's about the size. Kind of is there what? Oh, yeah. Um, make sure you're in the front silk screen layer. It actually should be okay because, yeah, yeah. I'm sorry, it doesn't matter because the we already made these footprints in the silk screen format, so we don't have to worry about what layer. We're on. So here's that student branch logo I just found online. Um, and you can, like I said, you can put any logo you want. Just make sure it doesn't go over any of the holes and don't make sure it overlaps any other silk screens. Now, if you want your silk screen to go to the back layer, you can click on the silk screen and then click E. And then right here in position, in the side drop down tab, you can select front or back. So you can see here, I have the same IEEE logo, but I have one on the front and I have one on the back. And I can verify this by going to the 3D viewer and view 3D viewer. There's my IEEE logo on the front. And then if you click this, it'll flip it to the back. And there's the IEEE logo on the back. Are you not seeing your logos? Uh, it's it said it's super big. Yeah, so those. Yeah. 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 Y
Well, yeah, that's why putting in those lights are really useful. So yeah. I know the size of the board. So then when I make custom logos or when I'm picking components, I know or I at least have an idea of how big that component is. Huh. Um, another change I made um, is I, I took the tab here for uh, lanyards or for um, little metal connectors. Uh, I made a, a much bigger space from the top of the board because I'm not sure how brittle these are going to be, but before I only had like half a millimeter maybe. I think we went over this last uh, week. Yeah. But so now I have about five and a half millimeters, which hopefully is enough space. And if you go to the 3D viewer, you can kind of get an idea about how much space that is. Some as maybe about a fingernail distance. So yeah, this should be a lot better. Hopefully, you can still get the uh, uh, the metal clips on it though. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> What's up? Uh, so my board has different dimensions, but uh, from the top. oh, here's here's all the dimensions. So it's uh three point zero five millimeters high. The length of the lines are twenty two point fifty two ninety eight mm -hmm. millimeters, and then the radius of the semicircles are point one point five two four millimeters. I see you have the Yeah. Um, uh, to add that, make sure you go to the front silk screen layer. And then you're going to click on the right here, add a text item. Oh, you okay. can see in front silk screen. Uh, oh, yeah. That, I'm, maybe I'll, I could remove it. So, yes. <laughs> Then you can change it too and stuff. <laughs> right, yeah. <laughs> it's hard because they require at least five orders of whatever board design you're going. So if I did each person's name, I would have to do five blank boards of each person. And then, you know. Right, right. And, and that's what JLCPCB at least. There's many other manufacturers that are much more stingy, like they require 20 or 50 or 100. Because it all depends on like what type of manufacturers there are. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, so one more thing about the logos is um, when I add a logo, you'll see it comes with this G silk screen, and you can't delete this because it's the designator for the uh, footprint. So what you can do is you can click on the G because I, I don't want that to show up on the board. I just want the logo. So you can click the designator, you click E on your keyboard. And then I want to change this to the user comments layer and you'll see it turn blue. And now it's not on the silk screen layer and it won't show up on your board now. And so that's what I did here with both of these designators is I turned them into the user comments. So that way, when I go to the 3D viewer, you don't see the G star star. Um, one thing to keep in mind is depending on the manufacturer, they may or may not be able to make the space and might mesh together and be one color, one solid color. So we'll, we'll see if they're capable of doing that. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. Oh, so when 
when you actually manufacture the board, yeah, the software says, oh, yeah, I recognize this logo. But the actual machinery, when they put the silk screen in, it might blotch a little bit and then it might merge the small spaces here. Yeah. Um, so I, I put that in the front and the back of the board. And that's about it. So now at this point, once you've got everything, you're... Uh, so you would just import a second logo? So the exact same logo you had before? Um, and then you're, you're going to want to put that logo where you want it. So I just overlapped it right with the other one. And then click E. And then go to position here. And then side and change it to back. And then click OK. And it'll even flip it for you too so that it's inverted. So that way, if I go to the 3D viewer, when I look at the front, it's the right direction. And then when I flip it, it's the right direction. It doesn't, it's not the wrong way. So it'll change that for you, which is really nice. I'm not sure about that. Um, so I click the on it. Oh, so you have No worries. So that's pretty much it. Uh, congratulations, guys. You've completed your first PCB design. Um, yeah. <laughs> so uh, now you can take this design and uh, we'll get it ready for production. So the way you do that is in this same file you're going to go to. Actually, you know what? First, um, I'm going to go ahead, go to your folder, go to your projects, and in the project folder that you have, um, go ahead and create a new folder. So I called it IEEE Badge Fabrication Files. So this is where I'm going to put all the files that are going to be used by the manufacturer. Um, there's mainly just two file formats. It's Gerber and DRL for the drill holes. So they'll have you upload the Gerber file, and then you'll they'll have you upload the drill hole files or they'll want it all together in one and you just zip the folder and upload that. And then they'll unzip it. When they open up your Gerber, they'll see the PCB design you just made. And they'll also see the, uh, the position of every single hole they have to drill in the board. That's every hole for every via and for every uh, through hole component. So once you made that folder, then you can go to file fabrication outputs, and then you're going to click on Gerber's. You're going to click on uh, generate Gerber job file. If that's not already selected, it should be by default. Um, you're going to want to select the output directory. So you go to your folder and then just uh, double click in the folder you want. Select yes. So we're going to use, it's going to save everything in this location. And then these are all the layers that it's going to print out. Um, I believe KiCad selects these automatically based on what you have on your board.
but some manufacturers will require more or less of each layer. Um, and maybe that's something to consider. Maybe you selected front and back adhesive on your board, but the manufacturer doesn't do front or back adhesive. So when you get your board and you're like, hey, there was no adhesive on my components, um, maybe it's because they don't do it. So, uh, But it's possible that they'll just deny your board design up front if they don't do it. Um, I, I personally haven't had any of my designs rejected yet. So I'm not sure, it's probably different with every manufacturer. But the main layers you need are the front and back copper, uh, the paste, silk screen, mask, and the edge cut so they know the borders of your board. Um, everything else is extra, and I, I don't think they need any of this other stuff. So you're just gonna click on plot, and wherever you put that folder, it'll generate those files. Don't worry about generating extra like files on top of files. It will automatically save over any of the files you had before. And then click on generate drill files and a new pop-up will show up with the same output folder. Um, and then you have a bunch of different options depending on your manufacturer, what they want. We want Gerber X2 file format and generate drill files. And it'll say done. Um, and the messages, so I can close that. It says done here in the output messages for when we generated the Gerber files. So we can close that. And we now have all the design files set up. So now you can go back to the main folder here and you're gonna click on Gerber Viewer because you're gonna want to see what it generated and you wanna make sure it was right, okay? So you're gonna go to file, Open Gerber plot files. I'm gonna to go to those fabrication files folder I just made. And you're gonna to want to select all the uh, all the Gerber files. Except for that one. <laughs> uh, Gerber job, you don't need that file. So you just need all the Gerbers and then uh, you'll also need the drill files. And the drill files are pretty important because you want to make sure that all the drill holes overlap properly with your board. So for example, let's see. Yeah, so it's kind of hard to see uh, due to the color coding and your color coding might be different than mine. But when I select this layer, for a uh, padded through hole drill, um, you can see a little circle right there. So it, it's telling the software, I need a hole drilled here, and I need another hole drilled here, and so on for the rest. Um, you're, yeah, you. so everything is good. Um, I'm actually gonna try and figure out the color coding here. Uh. All right, I was hoping there was like a reset. Oh, there is a reset the defaults. Maybe it's somewhere else, but um, regardless, uh, this is a good design. So everything is where it properly should be. Um, you can view all the different layers by clicking on the little diamonds here. So it'll highlight each layer and you can make sure everything's there. You can also click the check marks. That'll make the layers go away so you can see more of the board. So here's our front silk screen, all the gray. Here's all the components. All the holes are lined up and we're ready to go. So, um, I can't remember if I went over with you guys, but I did make that light blue in the background is a copper plane. 
So I believe I walked you guys through that. You guys all have that? Okay. So yeah, yeah, that's all. That's what this big sheet of green is. So, so once you've uh, once you're done viewing, you just close this. You don't have to save it or anything. Um, and now you're all set up. You would submit you would submit your Gerber files and your drill hole files to whatever manufacturer, and they'll make your board. Um, so that's everything. That's the whole process of PCB design. We walked, we went through the schematic and then we made the PCB layout uh, and the cutout of the board. We, we assigned all the footprints and everything. And then um, we generated the Gerber and drill files. One extra file type that you might need if you were to be, if you wanted the manufacturer to make the components for you, then you would have to generate a bill of materials. And then you would also have to list uh, what components you want them to use. So usually uh, they'll have a certain company they'll go through. So JLC PCB uses LCSC. So you have to find every component in stock. That's the keyword in stock and properly pick the component for your board. So it has to be the right dimensions and everything. Uh, you have to manually pick that. And that's really hard and it takes a lot of time. So, uh, so the, they'll ship it with your board. They'll put everything on for you and then send it back to you. But if you don't include bill materials, they'll just make the board. When they get the board do they have it in Yeah, okay. that's the point. I think depending on the manufacturer, you can use exterior components, but you're going to pay for shipping and it ain't cheap. <laughs> depending okay. where the manufacturer is because JLC PCBs in China, so you'll be shifting every, sh uh, <laughs> you'll be shipping everything to China. <laughs> it's not yeah. ideal. That's going to cost a lot of money. So, Certainly. yeah, <laughs> exactly. Or this is discontinued. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I, I've been having issues recently with uh, component stock. Um, it, I've had a really hard time finding stuff. I think everyone's trying to get Yeah, yeah, it is It is common across the board. So um, so it's in the same fabrication outputs here, BOM, Bill of Materials. Um, and let's go ahead and do that. Let's see what happens. Yeah, I'm curious. So it's a CSV file format. I'm just curious what it looks like. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I just put in the uh, the fabrication files. Yep. So, yeah, so you, you can actually open up CSV file formats and Excel as well. Um, I don't exactly remember how, but so you're going to have one cell named ID, one's going to be called designator, one's package, one's quantity, and so on. And then it'll fill in all the values under those sections. So you see uh, supplier and reference number, there's nothing. Uh, designation, nothing. Quantity, nothing. Oh, no, that might be the quantity. Four. Point, so designation, maybe that's the value. Okay. And then there's no supplier and there's no reference number. Um, so I'm guessing you would have to add those. I, I haven't messed around with that too much because I'm going through JLC PCB, so I have a slightly different process. But you can add different uh, fields in, in these component values. And I'm guessing that's probably where you would add it, and then it would put it in the BOM maybe. Uh, I'm not sure, though. Uh, let me show you. I'll show you guys what I use, basically. So since I go through JLC PCB, um, 
one of the things I had to do is uh, JLC PCB doesn't use the same comma separated value format as uh, Keycat. So I had to download a plugin to work with JLC PCB so I can make a BOM that I could submit to them. You probably could have changed everything in the Excel format to match their template, but I just didn't feel yeah. like doing that. So um, if you go to the KeyCAD main page, you can click on plugin and content manager and you, um, you'll be by default in the KeyCAD official repository and you can download any of these plugins and they may or may not work. So <laughs> you're kind of uh, taking a chance to see if they'll work. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, KeyCAD itself is open source. So. Um, so I found one called uh, Bounty's KeyCAD repository. He has a GitHub and you can look it up online. And essentially what you do is you go to manage, you add, you add this and you name it Bounty's KeyCAD repository and you put in the link that he gives you and you click save. And then this drop down will have the two different repositories. And in that repository is whatever plugin. So in this case, it's a JLC KeyCAD PCB tool plugin. And I would just click install. Once you have the plugin installed, um, from, from my case, it pops up here on the PCB new. And this is what I've used in order to create my build materials, my Gerber files and everything. It generates all of it for you. So basically I have to go through every single component here. I click on select part um, and it'll go to LCSC's library and I will look up. It's very finicky. So sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. You're way better off going to the LCSC page and searching for the component and then putting in a part number this thing guaranteed will pull up the part number, but sometimes if I just type in like the, the name of the thing, it won't always pop up. So here's some battery management ICs, a lot of them. <laughs> uh, and it shows you how much stock there is and everything. So it's really nice. And then here it also shows you uh, joints. So, oh, I did not want to do that. Yeah. Yeah, unfortunately. So, yeah, so this is the part number for LCSC. So I can just type uh, C6514 and boom, there it is. There's also 1424, 1445, 1 1.91. And then you would select your part. Um. And then it'll tell you how how many are in stock to six nine one. Okay. Yeah, and you didn't have to get it, but uh, if you want to, do that. yeah, definitely. Um, so it shows you right here the stock numbers. These are sometimes inaccurate, but for the most part, they're the same. So make sure you go online at LCSC. You make sure it's the same part. Oh, that's convenient. Mm -hmm. It is very convenient, and it makes the process a little bit easier. So once you would finish your, this, you would click Generate Fabrication Files, and it will create a JLC PCB folder, and then it'll put all the files in for you. So here's the BOM and position files. Here's the Gerber files and the zip folder for it already too, which can make your life easier sometimes. I'm not sure what this is. I think that's just part of the software uh, or part of the plugin, but this isn't used for anything, I don't think. And that's it. So you would upload again, the Gerber files and the BOM, which that plugin creates it in the proper file format for JLC PCB, so. You would cement all that online and then your design would be made. So. Sometimes they want your Gerber files all zipped together rather than sit individually. So they'll have you submit a zipped folder instead. Is it like all Yeah, yeah. For the most part. Um, yeah. 
so that that's it with this design um we're finished um the i'm just going to show you guys really quick uh the next thing we're going to start working on is we're going to start making a developer kit um it's going to be compatible with a breadboard it's going to be a four layer board so it's going to cost more um but that's so i could keep the size small um so here's the schematic for that board and I'll walk you guys through it a little bit. Um, remember that this is mostly for visual. So I'm, I'm going to show you guys a lot of stuff like, uh, yeah, so that we're going to build this next week. Oh, man. Okay. What is it? Yeah, yeah, it's a ESP32 developer kit. But I know a lot of different things that use ESP32 boards, so. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, I remember that. Um, So we're basically going to take this and then we're going to sign all the footprints like we did before. And then the fun part to me is actually making the layout. So this is going to be the actual board. Um, and it's pretty small, right? <laughs> um, and it can fit in breadboards. Um, so that's what the pin headers are for. Uh, 32. So here's what the uh, developer kit will actually look like. Uh, this is a whole thing, and it'll, you'll be able to plug this into your breadboard. And... Yeah, how about? <laughs> well, let's go ahead and find out, because I, I have the units. So. It's 2 by 2, 2.29 2 inches by 1.46 inches. So, it's yeah. very small. <laughs> yeah, a lot smaller than a credit card. <laughs> uh, it's maybe the size of, like, that. <laughs> wow. Your first two fi digit fingers. Finger digits, <laughs> whatever. Um, so some differences to notice. Uh, there's the red and blue like before. But we also have green and we have orange. Okay, so those are the two inner copper layers. Everything else is the same. Um, we can actually go to the PCB editor here. Editor here and, uh, like previously, I showed you guys, um, you can go to the board stack up and we can see what the actual layers are. So we have four copper layers, um, front copper, dielectric, inner copper, dielectric, inner two, dielectric, and now the back. And then there's all the, um, the mask to insulate everything, paste so that everything solders, and silk screen for logos and uh de de designators oh man long day so and i also made a couple of changes uh you can find this in the textbook i submitted you guys can see um i have a book on my pnw life to walk you guys through this it also has information about this but um it it's going to be pretty quick and we're not going to manually route this. I'm going to show you guys how to use an auto router. Okay. So the auto router will route all the tracks for you, but you just need to keep in mind the auto router is garbage and it's just to give you an idea like, okay, did I place these components in reasonable places? Are all the connections easily made? Uh, is there somewhere else where there's not a lot of traces where I can put the component there maybe in It'll open up some space for some other traces that or routes that I didn't think of taking previously. Um, the for the layout is going to be pretty much the same. Um, same layout. And then uh, if you guys didn't notice, we're also going to be working with surface mount components this time. And that's because I want to actually manufacture these and then um, Maybe I'll solder the pin headers on, or maybe I'll have them do it. I haven't decided yet. It'll cost more money because 
whenever you have through hole components being soldered onto your board, it's going to cost you more money because there's no machine that can accurately put every pin into the holes properly. So there's a person that physically has to put it on the board and solder it. So that's labor and you're going to pay more for that. Compared to the surface mount components, the machine just stamps it on, puts the paste, puts it through a microwave and it's done. So it's cheaper. Yeah, maybe we can watch something. I'll, I'll look for a video on YouTube. We can play one, but uh, that concludes this session. Uh, next week, we'll start on this developer kit and uh, I'll walk you guys through putting everything together and I'll help you guys get the uh, auto router set up too. So. That's not bad. Yeah, yeah. All right. Uh, for you guys watching the recording, thank you so much for watching this video. Um, I hope you guys are as excited as I am. I really look forward to walking you guys through this. Um, I will see you guys next week. Um, and we'll start in the developer kit. So I'll stop sharing and have a great week.